and we're ready and we got this. We're on? Okay, all right. Let's lift up our Bibles together and say this with me. This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Tonight, under the anointing, I will be taught the Word of God. My heart is receptive. My mind is alert. My ears are open. I expect to be challenged. I expect to be changed. For God's purposes, for God's glory, and the spreading of His gospel, I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, that's what I believe. Amen. And that's the way we approach the Word of God. Every time we come together, we believe this is God speaking to us. Father, now, as we dismiss for classes, we thank you for the children, the young people. We thank you for the adults and the Internet family. As we join in Bible study tonight, feed us from your table. Feed us richly and joyfully as we come to your table, believing your Word, giving thanks in all things. Your seed sown in our heart produces good, mighty, and holy fruit that will bring harvest for weeks, months, and years to come to your glory and the spreading of your gospel. We give you all praise and honor in Jesus' name. And in agreement with that, we all said together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go. And if you're in the auditorium, you can be seated with me. And let's open our Bibles to Psalms 91. Let's get in the word with great enthusiasm and joy tonight. Psalms 91. And while you're finding Psalms 91... We take a moment and we want to welcome our internet family. You are such an integral part of who we are and what we do. We thank God for you. You're our partners in ministry and we appreciate you being part of this church, especially those of you that consider this your home church and me, your pastor. You're special, you're honored, you're celebrated, and your support, prayer, giving, sowing, loving, serving, helping us, you're just a great blessing to us and we're thankful for our partnership in the gospel. We honor you. And pray tonight that you stand perfect and complete in all God's will and that you be blessed as we study. Remember these words from Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We expect faith to grow as we study God's word. Let's study together in Jesus' name. Well, you're blessed and highly favored tonight. Jesus is Lord tonight. And you are strengthened in Christ tonight. So be blessed, be encouraged. Let's read Psalms 91. 1 through 16, and then we'll draw our attention back to Psalms 91, 13. You've been given some notes, but don't be overwhelmed by that. First of all, I'm not going to try to preach all that tonight. That's good news, isn't it? Breakfast will be about 7 in the morning if I do that. <laughs> so we're not going to try to preach all that. And much of that is review. Uh, we'll just make some comments on the review, and then we'll go further tonight in our study. So Psalms 91, 1. He, you, me, we, us that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. That's in Christ. So we could say it like this. If you dwell in Christ, which is the place of the Most High, you shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we talk there about our dwelling. I live in Christ tonight. Acts 17, 21. In Him I live, move, and have my being. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk. In him. I live in Christ. He lives in me. That's our dwelling. Then our declaration in verse 2. I will say of the Lord. You have to open your mouth. So I'm going to open my mouth. And I'm going to say some things about the Lord tonight. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my joy. The Lord is my peace. The Lord is my righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is my life and salvation. My joy. I'm going to say some things about the Lord tonight. How about you? Your faith must speak in order to be activated. So I will say of the Lord, He is. Notice, not was or will be. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. And then number three here, we looked at our deliverance. He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noise and pestilence. Cover thee with His feathers. Under His wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. The pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. It shall not come nigh thee. That's good news. So people may be dropping on the left and right, but I'm standing, praise God. I'm still here. Praise God. Our enemies have tried to take us out, but we're still here. Our enemies have tried to remove us, but we're still here. 
Because God is for us, Jesus with us, the Holy Ghost is in us, angels are around us, and God's word is true. He does not lie and cannot fail. We are blessed tonight. We're still standing with vision. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. It shall not come nigh thee. Only with your eyes shall behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made, you do this by faith, you've made the Lord, David said, my refuge. And a refuge is a place where you run in and out of. And in the old covenant, all they could do is run into God and run out of God. They couldn't stay because the way had not been made. But you and I, we have something more than just a refuge. We have a dwelling in Christ. He said, you've made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. So see, I live in God. He lives in me. Listen to this. No evil shall befall thee, neither any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's good news. He shall give his angels charge over me and over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And I'm always mindful of these two giant gentlemen, I call them, that are always with me. I can always, I'm always aware of this one on the right. If God would let you see tonight, there is a, there is a giant angel. He's, he's right here. I can sense him and feel him. He's right here. He's always with me. And this one on the left, I'm not quite as sure about what he looks like, but I'm sure about this one. But I know he's there. He gives his angels plural charge over thee. You've always got angels with you. And they're sent to help you. They're sent to serve and bless as you speak God's word. Angels hearken to the word of God in your mouth. So the great deal we learn about angelic ministry. And he says, they bear thee up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Our text again for tonight. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon. You shall trample under feet. And then verse 14, because he, and this is our discernment. Now we realize that he's talking about Jesus here. Jesus has set his love upon me, the father. Therefore, I divide him. I will set him or I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. He will call upon me. I will answer him, be with him in trouble. Deliver him and honor him, and with long life will I satisfy him. Jesus has been alive for 2,000 years. That's a long life. The God man's been alive for 2,000 years. That's a long life. But the good news is this man continues forever. Let's shout tonight Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So there's a lot there, but we're back to verse 13 one more time. You will tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon, you shall trample underfoot. So we talked about our dwelling in the psalm, our declaration, our deliverance, and now our dominion. You'll notice that you are to be treading upon the lion. 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The adder is the serpent, Luke 10, 19. I give you power to tread on serpents. The young lion represents poverty because the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. So the spirit of poverty is portrayed in this young lion because they suffer hunger and that were to tread upon the spirit of poverty. And then the dragon is in Revelation chapter 12 and he is a lying false witness against the word of God and we trample them under feet. So notice we tread and we trample. To tread means there's a well-worn path and to trample means this ain't even close. You're victorious. So I'm going to preach to you tonight, your victory in Christ is not even close. You're more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37, you're more than a conqueror through him who loved you and gave himself for you. You're more than a conqueror, an overcomer, and thanks be unto God, which causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. I'm an overcomer. I'm a victor. I'm a champion in Christ. And it's not me, but it's Christ in me. It's not what I've done, it's what he's done. It's not my works, it's his works. It's not my ability, it's his. Not my anointing, it's his. He's made me a champion. He's made me an overcomer. I'm a winner because I'm connected to the champion. He's the undisputed, unchallenged, unquestioned, unparalleled champion of the universe, past, present, and future. His name's Jesus. Now, there's no one like him, no one beside him. He has no rival, he has no equal, he has no sequel. His name is Jesus. Praise God. And in Christ... You are victorious. So we are walking in this great victory that God has given to us. So now, if you will, I want you to go with me to Numbers chapter 11. Go there and you can hold your place. And I'll do a little bit of review and then we'll start on tonight's lesson. Got some great things for you tonight. Numbers chapter 11. So we started this with the word of life. We're just feeding from the table of showbread on Wednesday nights. We're in the word of life. And we discovered that God has life. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And we found out in Romans 5.10, we're saved by his life. 
His death reconciled us, but His life saves us, heals us, and delivers us. And Jesus lives in us. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. So my life is in Christ. Christ is my abundant life. And the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 9. So I have a promise. And what I was always taught in church, that heaven's sure, that heaven's secure, that I don't have to worry. If I know Jesus, I'm going to heaven. And that's true. And we thank God for the hope of heaven. I know myself, it would be very hard for me to live not knowing my eternity was secure. I would not want to live not knowing where I would spend eternity if I didn't wake up in the morning. If I don't wake up in the morning, oh, praise God. Now, you could grieve for me and my destiny in the earth, but I'll be doing fine to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and I'll go to be with Jesus. And that'd be the greatest time of my life is to leave this body and go to be with Jesus. And that's the way we have to approach this life. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is a gain. And when you start realizing that death is just an entrance way into that which is far greater, you stop fearing death. There's no need to fear what's gained to me. So, but I'm not going to die in the morning with God's help by God's grace because I've got work to do in the earth and I've prayed that God fulfill my, both my days and my destiny. That being settled, but I was always taught heaven's sure, but this life is unsure. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what God's going to do. But I found out in 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 9, we have promise. And those words ring out like a trumpet. We have a promise. We have promise of the life, zoe in the Greek, that now is. And when I read that, it changed my whole perspective on living here because I have a promise. I'm not just getting, I'm not taking a chance when I get out of bed. You know, they'll tell you, you're taking a chance. Well, you could get in the shower in the morning and slip on a bar of soap and crack your head and you'd die. Oh, joy. Those are happy thoughts, aren't they? <laughs> Well, you could get in your car and be killed on the way to work, or, or you could drop dead of a heart attack. No, this life is sure because of the promise. We're living in a fallen rim. We're living in a difficult place, but we have something bigger than the difficult place. We have a promise. And I want to thank God for His faithfulness to His Word. God keeps His Word. God is faithful to His Word. God honors His Word. And so we rejoice in His faithfulness to His Word. So I found out I have a promise of the life that now is. And there are two things to qualify. First of all is your identity. You must be the seed of Abraham. And we established that in our study, Galatians 3, 7 and Galatians 3, 9. We which are faith of the children of Abraham. We which are faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, Galatians 3, 7 and 3, 9. We're redeemed from the curse and the blessing of Abraham comes on us, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. And then in Galatians 3.29, if you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed and become an heir to the promise. And we added Romans 8.17, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. So then I went back to study the life of Abraham, and I found out, and this is in your notes, there are five aspects to Abraham's blessing now in this life. Perfect righteousness without the law. Jesus becomes your righteousness. That's the place it begins. Jesus must make you right with God. There's no other way to be right with God than our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I have a meager amen to that? There's no other way to be right except through Jesus. Jesus is my perfect righteousness. And then number two, peace, rest, liberty from the curse. Fear not, Abram. Don't be afraid. Number three, where we are, protection and a revelation of the Lord is your shield. Abraham, I'm your shield. So I have a shield around me. You can't see it, but there's a shield around me. Psalms 5, 12, the Lord blesses the righteous and he will encompass them with favor like a shield. So everywhere you see me, there's an invisible shield around me called favor. I'm favored. I have favor with God and man. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm filled and free. My foundation sure because I'm the blessed seed of Abraham in Christ. And then we have prosperity, riches, and liberality. He said, Abraham, I'm your exceeding great reward. I'm your reward. This is all in Genesis 15. 1. I'm your reward. I'm your blessing. If you need help, I'm your help. If you need healing, I'm your healing. If you need strength, I'm your strength. If you need wisdom, I'm your wisdom. If you need money, I'll be your bank. Whatever you need, that's who I am. Come on, let's shout tonight. He's El Shaddai. He's the almighty God. He's my source and my supply. Praise God. He's a good God. He's a good God. And then finally, he promised Abraham preservation, rejuvenation, and length of days. He said in Genesis 15, 15, you'll go to your fathers in peace in a good old age. And at 99, Genesis chapter 18 said, Abraham ran to the herd to get a calf to bring it back and gave it to a young man. The word ran in Hebrew means he darted with agility, 
with skill and with strength. He went and picked up a calf. Now, I'm not a farm boy. We used to go to the farm in West Virginia. But those calves aren't all that small, even when they're born. But this wasn't a newborn calf. This calf was at least old enough to be, be a meal. And so Abraham picked him up and gave him to a young man. That blesses me every time I read it. This 99-year-old man, he goes down there and gets the calf and gives it to a young man. Praise God. That's what I'm going to be doing in my old age. Praise God, because it's a good old gay age, and I have peace or shalom in my old age. Now, tonight, we're back up at the shield part. We're in Psalms 91 at the shield part. So here's where we are. God has given us great victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've got Joshua chapter 10 there, look at that in your notes. We're looking. We've already overcome the king of Jerusalem. We're looking at the king of Hebron, which means false associations or yokes. So the question tonight is, what are you in agreement with? The way you get yoked to anything is get in agreement with it. What do you agree with? Christianity is called the great agreement. Whatever you agree with is what's going to be yoked in your life. Jesus was in agreement with the Father. He said, I'm my Father one. I'm in agreement with Jesus. And Jesus said, take my yoke. Jesus was yoked to the Father. I'm yoked to the Father. I want to be in agreement with the Father. My whole life is being lived on this one thought. I'm going to agree with God. What do you think? What do you believe? What do you say? What do you do, Father? What do you want me to do? What do you think about this? What do you believe? What do you do? What do you say? And I want to agree with God. And that's the tree of life. Life can only come when you agree with God. Every time you disagree with God, death starts working. Carnal mind starts working. Confusion starts working. So we thank God we're in agreement with God. Now, there are five things that yoke believers here. and Five things believers get in agreement with that greatly hinder them. The first is this. Strife. So we don't want any strife in our life. We walk in love. And God knows there are plenty of people to keep you from walking in love. People can become a stumbling block. People will try your patience. There'll be some days you feel like you've got one nerve left and somebody's standing on it. You ever been there? Where it feels like, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I've had about all I can take. You, you just, people. So you learn to be peaceful and walk in love. I was talking with a man today. Call me. I've known him long ago. And he called me today and he was telling me, what, it's funny, he's telling me what a great, how, how good he was doing in Christianity. And then something happened and he started cussing somebody right on the phone. He just, he just, he's talking to me, he said, I got to call you back and hung it up. And he just started, but I heard him. He said a bunch of explicatives that he shouldn't have said. Boy, they just drug him right over in the ditch. I don't know who it was or what it was or why it was, but whatever happened to him right there, he just lost his peace. It's not necessary to do that. I don't want anybody having that much control in my life. I want to walk in love. And you have to set your heart. The commandment of the Lord is, this is my commandment that you love one another. So we set our heart, no strife in my life. And now we've covered fully now this thought of fear, worry, and care, and anxiety. God doesn't want you to have any fear. Look at me, no fear. No fear. No worry. No care. No anxiety. God wants you carefree, not careless, not careful. He wants you carefree. And the more I live carefree, the more I realize how often I'm burdened down. The more that I experience this carefree lifestyle that God wants me to live, casting all your care on Him, He cares for you, the more I realize I've lived most of my Christianity shackled and yoked to fear, worry, and concern. God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but a power of loving of a sound mind. And you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So no care, no fear, no worry. And most Christians don't treat fear, worry, and care as though it were a sin. But I'm learning to treat fear, anxiety, and care as though it were a sin. I treat it the same way I would as a temptation to, to steal or to lie. No, that's not in agreement with God. I cast my care on the Lord. I'm free tonight. And thank God I don't have a care. Now, this next one's going to be real fun. You ready? Complaining and murmuring. Complaining and murmuring. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. This will be fun. We're going to have a good study here for the next couple of weeks. No murmuring, no complaining. Numbers 11, 1. Have you found Numbers 11, 1? And when the people complain, the people complained, it displeased the Lord. So I want you to get this seed put in your heart tonight. 
When I complain, it displeases the Lord. My heart is to please the Lord. When they complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled against them, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. They complained, and it displeased the Lord. So my complaining, my murmuring, murmuring means to spend the night in the Old Covenant. It's the Hebrew word loon, L-U-W-N. It means to spend the night. Well, I often say it this way, you know, you know, murmuring will get you one night in hell's hotel. You get an overnight stay in hell's hotel when you murmur and complain. And if you murmur long enough, you'll get an extended pass, an extended stay. I can tell I'm knocking the shout out of you on a Wednesday night already. It displeased the Lord. Then to the new covenant quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Ooh, this one got me when I read this. This brought the fear of the Lord on my heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 10. He says, neither murmur ye. And murmuring is complaining, fault finding, whining, criticizing, uh, being discontent, always letting that just always come out of your life. Don't murmur, don't complain, don't be discontented, as some of them also murmured and were discontent and were destroyed of the destroyed. So my complaining opens up the door for destruction in my life. My murmuring displeases God. It opens up destruction in my life. It opens up and gives Satan access to me when I murmured. They murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Not of God, but of the destroyer. So your complaining can open the door for you to be destroyed. You to be eaten alive. And then one more, Philippians chapter 2.14. Philippians 2.14, just an exhortation. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Whatever you're doing, if you're going to pray, if you're going to come to church, if you're going to work, whatever you do, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, these three verses make it very clear that God is displeased, that murmuring opens up the door for destruction in my life, and that God said, don't do that. Now, when you tell your children not to do something, you fully expect them to obey, don't you? Do all things without murmuring and disputing. So these three verses, God used them to get murmuring out of my life. And I'm a lot better than I used to be. Although I have to say, I had three wonderful chances today. Somebody said to me, now I'm going to tell you something, don't get mad. And whenever they say that, you already know. I felt the anger rise up. I'm going to tell you something, but I don't want you to get mad. Okay, what is it? I know that doesn't happen to you, but it happened to me. Okay, what is it? Just tell me. Just get it out in the open. So I had three really good chances today to get aggravated, to murmur, and to complain. But thank God I passed all three by. I had to catch myself on the one. I started to on the one. But God said, now remember, we're going to talk about this tonight. It'd be better not to do it. Since you're going to preach on it tonight. Uh, it'd be better not to do it since you're going to preach on it. So here we go to our outline. Now the problem with murmuring and complaining. The problem. God inhabits your praise, does he not? And if you want to create an atmosphere around you, if you want to create an aura around you, an atmosphere around you, you praise the Lord. His praise shall be continually. In my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. The book of Psalms chapter 8 and Psalms chapter 9 tell you that when you praise the Lord, He manifests and your enemies and the avenger is stilled or He's driven back by the presence of God. And God inhabits the praises of His people. So that means corporately, when we come together, we should praise God. He inhabits you because He lives inside you. He lives in you. So when we come in the sanctuary, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We begin to worship like we did tonight. You'll notice we sang about the blood. We worshiped in the blood. We sang about the blood. And God fills our praise and we're literally making a seat for him to sit in so he can come and be glorified in our midst. Corporate praise is very powerful. It creates a corporate anointing. He enthrones himself in the praises of his people. 
So in 2010, when I was going through the test and trial of my life, my most difficult period of life up to this point has been 2010, February 1st, till about the end of June 2011. So it would be about, uh, what, 16, 17 months. Tough trial. Uh, I just pray it don't get any tougher than that. Tough trial, hard trial, difficult. And in the midst of that, I found myself complaining quite a bit. Now, you got to remember, that was, what, 14 years ago. I've grown a little bit in 14 years. Hopefully, you've grown a little bit in the last 14 years. Hopefully, you're neither as ignorant or mature as you were, immature as you were 14 years ago. You've grown a little bit in 14 years. So back then, and I was in here one day with a bitter complaint before the Lord. And I'd got to where I just didn't have a filter anymore. I just, I would complain and complain, and my filter was gone. I wasn't even trying to hold it, and I would just let it fly to whoever, whenever, wherever, because I was that upset, that aggravated, that tortured, that tormented. And one day, the Lord stopped me. I was right here, walking back and forth, and tears running down my face. And he said, let's me and you talk. You know how God does. He said, time for us to conversate. Time for me and you to talk. Let's talk. You remember? Can we talk? Come, let us reason together. That's the way he said it in the Bible. But come, let's, you and me sit down. Let's have a father-son talk, shall we? And he said, now, I want you to answer some questions for me. Who inhabits your praise? And I said, you do. And he said, so when you praise me, you make it easy for me to flood your life with an overflowing atmosphere of blessing and favor when you praise me and give me thanks. Yes, sir. Then he asked me one of the most pointed questions I've ever been asked in all my life. He said, then who inhabits your complaint? And I shut up and got real quiet. And he said, you know the answer. You are making it easy for Satan to inhabit your life because you have built a throne. You have made him comfortable with your complaining. You make your enemy comfortable when you complain. And if you do it enough, you'll build him a seat. He'll get the TV remote. He'll get some popcorn. He'll get some Pepsi. Make himself at home. And he'll say, I like this. Just keep on. And he'll nudge you on and edge you on and push you on to complain and complain. Because you make your enemy comfortable when you murmur and complain. And when God said that to me, that one brought me to my knees. I kneeled down right here in front of this chair. I kneeled down and I said, Lord, I ask for cleansing. I plead the blood of Jesus. I ask you to help me. And with your help, by your grace, by your spirit, I'll rise. And if you'll help me, if you'll help me, I'll get the complaining out of my life. If you'll help me. I can't do it on my own. It's too natural. It's too easy. It just seems like it's just too natural. You know how easy it is to complain. It's just easy to complain. Some of you are looking at me. It's easy to complain. Who inhabits your complaint? So just think now. If God inhabits my praise, then my, my enemies inhabit my complaint. So God wants me to get the complaining out of my life. Because when you start praising God, and you start thanking God, then your enemies become very uncomfortable. I think it'd be good if we would just say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to your word. That makes my enemy uncomfortable. When I say, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the cleansing power of the blood. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your deliverance. Thank you for your dominion. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that Jesus lives in me. It makes my enemies very uncomfortable. And it puts a distance between me and my enemies when I do that. It puts a distance between me and my enemies when I do that. So the problem with complaining is it makes your adversaries comfortable. If you complain, it'll make sickness comfortable in your life. It'll make poverty comfortable in your life if you are always complaining. So we've got to come to a place where it displeased the Lord. And I'm out to please you. I want to please you. I'm yours to command. I'm yours to correct. I'm yours. I belong to you. Whatever you want, I'm here to serve you. I'm here. I'm yours. I want to be yours. You got to get that far. Not my will but thine be done. I'm yours. You want to command me? You want to correct me? I'm yours. I don't want to displease you. It's not my heart. I don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. I don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You can lie. You can tempt against the Holy Ghost. You can resist the Holy Ghost. You can grieve. You can quench and despise. There's seven sins in the New Covenant against the Holy Ghost. You can commit them on a regular basis. I don't want to grieve the Spirit. 
I pray daily. If you're grieved, I want to know it. I don't want to sear my conscience to where you're grieved and I don't have no clue you're grieved. I want to know if you're, if you're not pleased, I don't want to be pleased either. I want to walk with you. I want to be congruent with you. I want to be in harmony. Because that's where the victory is. That's where the life is. That's where the blessing is. That's where the flow is. It's when you stay congruent with the Holy Ghost. So I pray now in Jesus' name, help me. And I got up from that place of repentance because it broke me. And I realized I had just opened up the door and said, come on in. Come on in. Turn my life up. Come on in. Torment me in the night. And during that time, I was having panic attacks at night. I was being woke up, and that thing would be sitting on my chest. That problem was sitting on my chest. I'd wake up. I'd get out of bed. It would stare me in the eye. I'd get out of the shower. It'd be staring me in the face. It didn't matter where I was, what I was doing. That problem, that pressure, that pain always staring me right in the face. And, and I was inviting it in and making it worse by my constant, continually talking about it and complaining about it. Complaining displeases the Lord, opens up the door for destruction, and God said, don't do it. Now, that ought to make you serious enough, sober enough to say, all right, that's enough. No more complaining. I'm done with my complaining. I'm done with it. With God's help, by God's grace, by the Spirit, I am done with my complaint. And God knows, and I'm being honest, all of us have reasons to complain. As a matter of fact, you could probably sit down and come up with 10 or 12 good reasons to complain without even thinking hard about it. It's not fair. It's not right. This is wrong. This is wrong. What they said is wrong. What they did is wrong. And yes, you're probably right on all counts, but God wants to shift you by giving you an understanding of how important it is that you learn to give Him thanks and praise Him at all times and not get into complaining. When you complain, you're yoking yourself to your own destruction. I know that's sobering, but that's what the Bible teaches. So I'm thanking God tonight for the pathway of celebration. I want to tell you a few stories. Now, these aren't in your notes, but I like to read and go back in time, especially go back to the great healing revivals of the 1900s. So I want to give you a couple of stories here, and then I want to give you a couple of my own and just to help you understand where this is. There's a great healing evangelist in days gone by. His name was Raymond T. Ritchie. And he was along about the same time Smith Wigglesworth. He was in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Very powerful man. Very great man of God. He had tent in the 40s and the 50s, and he faded out and he died. I don't know exactly when he died, but very powerful man of God. And so he was having a healing line after he'd preached on healing in his tent, and a woman came through, and the Lord stopped Raymond T. Ritchie, and Raymond T. Ritchie, and I'm reading this in his book and in, in studying his life, and he said the word of wisdom came and said, Ma'am, you've already been prayed for by everybody that's got a name. Every name preacher lays hands on you, and you've got no help. Uh, all these preachers have prayed for you. Even Smith Wigglesworth have prayed for you. You've gotten no help. He said, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to pray for you. She said, you're not? He said, no, I'm not. He said, but I want you to do this one thing for me. He said, can you begin to thank God for His faithfulness to His Word that God says you're healed? And then she said, well, I know I'm not healed. And then he located her. Then he found, you see that, you know, if God says you're healed and you say you're not healed, then we know what the problem is. There's a disagreement there. There's a disconnect. But he says to her, I didn't say that you're healed. I said, can you thank God that he said you're healed? Just focus on what he said. And this woman had asthma, emphysema. She had chronic lung disease. And back then, you know, we're talking in the 1930s. I think this was in 37. So we're talking about there's a lot less help then than there would be now medically for somebody back then. Modern science has made marvelous advances in technology. So she began to do that. And now the woman switches to tell her testimony. Raymond T. Ritchie has got her letter, and he put an insert, an insert of her letter in the book. And it says, I was talking with my husband at the breakfast table, and she said, I got so caught up in thanking God for his faithfulness to his word. I want to always remember this. God's faithful to his word. I want to thank God you're faithful to your word. You are faithful to your word. I praise you for your faithfulness to your word. You honor your word. You keep your word. You're a God that cannot fail. You're a covenant keeping God. And she said, I've got caught up in this thanking God for his word that I don't remember the last attack I had. And she said, my husband said to me, it was 10 days ago. And now six years later, when this letter was written to Raymond T. Ritchie, it had been over six years. 
and the asthma disappeared, the COPD had disappeared, the chronic emphysema had disappeared, and she was well and whole and strong and got caught up and consumed with giving thanks to God that His Word said she was healed. I want to give thanks to God tonight. Praise God. I want to thank God for His faithfulness to His Word. I want to thank God He's faithful to His Word. He's faithful to His Word. And then the next story comes from Dr. Lillian B. Yeoman. And if you can get her book, she's got a, a, a large book now. It's a, it's a composite of all of her works. You can buy it. You can get it. Oh, I think you can get it at Amazon. Dr. Lillian B. Yeoman. And she was a surgeon back in the early 1900s, around 1910 or so. And uh, she, got, she got herself because she's trying to keep up the pace. Uh, back then, a female surgeon was unheard of. It was unheard of back then. And she made it. And she got herself hooked on some drugs. And uh, she got in very bad shape and found Christian science. And Christian science, when she believed it, it got her out of the pit. However, it couldn't keep her out of the pit. Christian science ain't nothing but a lie from hell. It tells you that, you know, you have God in you and you are God and your spirit is God. That's just a lie from hell. That's all it is. It's just a lie. You are not your own God. There's one greater than you. There's a God and you're not Him. That even the job, God Jr., that's not coming up and you're not going to get that job. So lay it down. Just trust there's somebody greater than you. There's a bigger force than you in the universe. Somebody's greater than you. There's one out there that loves you and He's greater than you are. And you're not your own God. You make yourself, you'll be the lousiest God you ever had. And so she got back in it. And while dying, while suffering, having lost her medical practice, this little Pentecostal preacher going door to door, knocked on her door. And came and told her about Jesus. And she remembered going to Sunday school as a little girl in a Methodist church. And so she accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And got born again. And then he came back a few days later and prayed with her. She got baptized in the Holy Ghost and spake with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And then he prayed for her. And glory to God, Jesus healed. Oh, come on. I wish I had a preaching church in here. He delivered her from the drugs. He set her free. He lifted her out of a horrible pit. He put her feet on a solid rock. He put a new song in her mouth. And her testimony is amazing. God delivered her. And she rose up. And instead of going back to medicine, she started preaching full time. In her 40s, she didn't go back to medicine. She went to preaching full time. And this is one of her sermons. It's called The Praise Cure. It's astounding. I have read that over and over. I read it again today. So she's telling the story of visiting one of her friends in California who has also had a missionary there who had been on the field for the Assemblies of God and they were, the missionary was telling her and her friend this story. And she said, I was on the field. Now you got to remember this is way back there in the 1920s or so, 19, late 20s. And she said, I was carrying and working in a village where smallpox broke out. And back then, no vaccines for smallpox. Deadly, it would kill you. And she said, I was taking care of a missionary who was working with me, and she got the smallpox, and I was boldly decreeing I wouldn't get smallpox, but then it came on me. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought, well, I won't get that, and then it comes on you? That's not happening to me, and then it comes on you? What do you do? What do you do? Because I think we've all done that before. All right, let me say it this way. I've done that. Done that before. I won't have that. I, I told you Sunday about Krista giving me the pocket chickens. Remember that? I told the doctor, shingles belong on the roof, man. I ain't getting no shingles. I didn't get shingles. You know what I got? I got the pocket chickens, which are chicken pop. I got the pocket chicken. I got the kid version, which only proves I'm still a kid at heart. I broke out with the kids version. I had calamine lotion on my forehead. They were all through my head. I had pink hair, man. I looked like Frankenstein. I had calamine lotion in my hair. It was horrible. Had to take oatmeal baths, all that on my back, that itching, that pain. So I boldly decreed to that doctor I wouldn't get shingles. I didn't, but I got the kid version of chicken pox, which Christia called the pocket chicken. She couldn't say chicken pox. She just said, Daddy, I got the pocket chicken. So I've done that before. And when she got sick, she said, Lord, what shall I do? I, I prayed. I've stood. I've, I've done all I know to do. And she drifted off to sleep, and the Lord gave this missionary a vision. And it would do you well to remember this all your days. She saw in this vision two scales. You know, the scales of justice must balance. 
And she saw, saw, saw two scales. And on the one side, the scales were weighty and heavy because she had prayed and prayed and prayed. And they had been praying for everybody in the village, but yet people were dying. And the prayer side of the scales were down to the ground. And on the other side of the scale was praise and thanksgiving. And it was up in the air and it was empty. And the Lord said to her in a vision, when your praise and thanksgiving balance out, become weightier than your prayer, then deliverance will come. And she woke up from that vision and started praising God with a delighted and spirit-filled praise. Her praise became contagious, she says in the book and the story, Dr. Yeoman says, because she said, why are they asked her, the doctor that was trying to care for these people, he said, why are you praising God like this? She said, because of every smallpox on my body, I will give thanks. Because the doctor told her, even if you get out of this, you're going to be disfigured for life. You'll never be right. You'll never look like a human being again. You're going to be scarred for life. And she said, I will give thanks to God for every pox on my body. And she praised God and praised God and praised God to where even people in the village would come around her, her quarantine and praise God with her. It became contagious. And she praised and praised God for three days, just giving thanks. Thank you for your faithfulness to your word. Thank you that you say I'm healed. Thank you that I praise you and I bless you. I'm not going to murmur that I've got smallpox. I thank you that your word says I'm healed. I praise you that your word says I'm healed. And then when the scales balanced and the praise and thanksgiving outweighed the prayer, then she stopped being a beggar. Because see, there comes a point where you just keep asking and asking, you become a beggar. And you're not beggars. I tell you by the Spirit of God, you're not beggars. You have a right to come boldly to the throne of grace. You have a right to march right in there before God and ask for mercy and grace and to help you in the time of your need. You are not beggars. You are sons and daughters. You are children. You are royal priesthood. You are not beggars. That's not who you are. And there comes a point when you keep asking and asking that you become beggars. God reminded me again today. He said, oftentimes in this situation with your son, you become a beggar. You keep begging. You keep asking. It's time for you to stop it. It's time for the scales to be balanced and for the scales to go the other way. Thank God Anthony's home. Thank God Brittany Seal. Thank God. Start thanking God like it's already done. Shout like you already got it. Rejoice like it's already yours. And me and little Daisy Bell had some church up in the backyard this afternoon. We had some church in the backyard this afternoon. I don't know if she knew what I was doing, but I was sure having a good time. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to your word. Me and my household shall be saved. You don't lie. You can't lie. You can't fail. Your word is true. My children shall be taught of the Lord. They shall be far from oppression. They shall be far from terror in Isaiah 54. Thank you, Lord. And this missionary, without realizing, suddenly and supernaturally, it happened. And all of a sudden, the manifestation of power came. And every pox and all of the virus and every symptom left her body. And she walked out of that quarantine hut well and whole and began to minister healing to that village. And that village called on. There's something powerful in your praise and in your thanksgiving to God. Because it takes just as much energy to give thanks as it does to complain. I want to shout tonight, don't you? Praise God. What a story. The woman healed of emphysema. A missionary on the field with no hope of help and to be disfigured. And, and the Lillian Yeoman goes on to write and said, and not even a scratch or a scar of smallpox upon her body because she learned to give thanks to God. I lay in that bed 10 years and two weeks ago up in Charlotte. Those gastrointestinal tubes down my throat. Pick line in my neck that got infected. Pick line in my arm. Laying there with what they call acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Deadly. Fatal. About 95% fatal. Pancreas blew up. Affected my liver. Affected my kidneys. Gallbladder went bad. Went gangrene. Gallstones. All this stuff. And their report was. Their report was. You'll never be right. If you come out of this, you'll never be right. You'll be a hopeless diabetic. You'll have an insulin pump. And said, you'll never eat meat again, and you'll always be on digestive enzymes, and you'll eat all of your food from a blender. You'll have to puree your food. That's what a high, highly skilled, schooled, and trained physician told me 10 years and two weeks ago. He looked me right now, and that's what he told me. And while laying there, I remembered the praise cure. While laying there, I remembered some of the things that I'd studied in days gone by. And with a feeble hand and with a trembling heart and tearful eyes, I began to lift this hand as much as I could with no strength and say, Lord Jesus, your word says I'm healed. Lord Jesus, your word says I'm healed. I thank you. 
I thank you. Your word says I'm healed. Your word says I'm healed. Your word, thank you for your faithfulness to your word. And I began that afternoon. And from that afternoon until now, I have thanked God over and over and over, thousands and thousands of times. I just want to report to you, thank God. I want to 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 give God thanks. There's no diabetes in my body tonight. My pancreas was completely restored. They told me it was dead, but God put it back alive. God gave me a new pancreas. I don't have to eat out of a blender. I don't eat digestive enzymes. I can meet any, eat meat anytime I want. I got healed in my body. It manifested in my body. I just think it's time we start celebrating. We, we just do not celebrate enough. God has wrought the victory. God has done what needs to be done. It's time to give praise to God. It's time to glorify God and get beside yourself and get radical in your praise. Get radical for Jesus and start thanking God and praising God. It's yours, beloved. Now thanks be unto God, which causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. In 2 Chronicles 20, Verse 20 down through 24. Jehoshaphat surrounded by enemies. No hope of survival. Enemies on every side. Enemies far greater than Israel was. God, what shall we do? The word of the Lord came and said, In the morning you will choose singers to go out before your enemies. And they will go before the Lord saying, Praise the beauty of His holiness. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, And as they began to sing, they began, it just stayed, they began to sing. No. They, some of you need to begin. Just, just start. If you just start, just start thanking God. My finances are turning around tonight, right now. Thank God my finances are turning around. My health is turning around. My family's turning around. It's turning around now, tonight. It's starting tonight. I'm not going to back up. I'm bold in my praise. I'm going to give God glory in my praise. Hallelujah. The Bible says there, and they began to sing. The Lord said, ambushments against the enemy. And the enemies killed each other. And they found three days spoil. And I see spirit, soul, and body there. They found three days spoil. And the enemy was routed. And the enemy turned on each other. The one thing that confuses and scrambles your enemies is the praise of God in your mouth. When you start giving thanks, they hit you with the best shot, but you give him thanks. They keep hitting you, but you give him thanks. They keep hitting you, but you give him thanks. They keep coming, but you give him thanks. And you just keep saying, God, I thank you. You're God. You're almighty. You're sovereign. You're faithful. You're holy. You're righteous. You're just. You're good. You're good to me. You watch over me. You're my God and my Father. And I praise you and bless you, see. You become powerful when you won't stop praising God. There's a pathway of celebration. Let me quote you a few verses, and then we'll go to Acts 16 and close tonight. Leviticus 22, 29, listen to this. You'll offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving at your will. That's the only sacrifice. Leviticus 22, 29. That's the only sacrifice that God ever said you could offer at your will. This is up to you. As much as you will to, want to, desire to, you can offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving at your will. That's the only sacrifice in the old covenant. God let them do it their will. Psalm 69 and verse 30. He said, I will magnify the name of my Lord with a song. And listen to this. I will magnify the Lord with thanksgiving. When you start thanking God, God starts to get bigger in your life. When you start thanking God, when you start remembering. You know what some of you need to do is go back down memory lane. Listen, it hadn't been for the Lord on your side, I guarantee you wouldn't be in this church tonight. If it hadn't been for the Lord on your side, some of you'd be dead. Some of you'd be in eternity. There's a couple of you in here, you might have been like in prison or jail or somewhere else, but you just need to go back and remember, He kept you. I remember when I was 14, ruptured appendix, He kept me. I remember 16, tore the top off my daddy's car, walked out of it without a scratch. God kept me. I remember 2010, He kept me. I remember 2014, He kept me. I want to say like David, if it hadn't been for the Lord on my side, my enemies would have triumphed over me. <laughs> oh, he's a good God tonight. Woo, praise God, he's a good God. You'll offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving at your will. Magnify the Lord with thanksgiving. How about this? Listen to it. Come on, shout with me tonight. We're getting ready to close here in a minute. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come on, open door. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come on, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands. How about this? Serve the Lord in gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord God, He made you and not yourself. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. He is God and we are the sheep of His pasture. 
Listen to it. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Psalms 105, 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His mercy is everlasting. Psalms 106, 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His mercy is everlasting. Psalms 107, 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His mercy is everlasting. I'm just wondering, what if we came in Sunday through those outer doors? When you walked up that sidewalk, you said, I'm going to come up there with thanksgiving. God, I thank you I'm alive. I thank you for the privilege to come to church with your people. I thank you that you're God. And when we walk in these doors today, you're going to meet us in full power and in full glory and in full revelation. We expect you to come. And when you walk through these sanctuary doors, I enter your gates with thanksgiving. I shout aloud with a voice of triumph. I give God the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God which causes us always to triumph in Christ and makes known the sweet smelling savor of His knowledge by us in every place. Ephesians chapter 5 starting at verse 15. He says, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Be not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Listen to it. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in Christ with thanksgiving. You abound in Christ with thanksgiving. Colossians 3.15 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing making melody in your heart to the Lord and whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father by Him in verse 15 said Let the peace of God rule in your heart to which you're also called in one body be ye thankful. Colossians 4.2 Continue in prayer watching the same with thanksgiving. Life verse. This next one's a life verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks. This is the will of God. If you're out of the will of God, the quickest way back in is to start giving God thanks. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Hebrews 13, 15. By Him, therefore, let us offer continually the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto His name. God wants you to be thankful. I've laid down my murmuring and complaining. God wants me to be thankful. God wants you to be thankful. Let's read Acts 16, 25, and we'll draw to a close tonight. Y'all, y'all, we've got a good atmosphere in here. It'd be just a good time to start thanking God and praising God. You don't need to beg God. You just need to balance the scales. That's what you need to do. You need to balance the scales. Start thanking God with some radical praise. Thanking God your needs are met. Thanking God your finances are changed. Thanking God your body's healed. I mean, get beside yourself and thank God your finances, your body, your mind, your family. Acts 16, 25, you'll know it well. And at midnight, that's a time of transition, one day to the next. But it's also oftentimes depicted in the Bible as a time of testing and trial. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they prayed and. And the Lord said to me again this afternoon, my people have prayed, but they haven't and yet. Look at that. My people, they've prayed, they've prayed. He said, open doors, prayed and prayed and prayed. You've prayed, but now it's time to pray and. They sang praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. So this ain't no shy praise. It, it, what difference does it make who hears you praising God? What difference does it make? There comes a place of desperation where it don't matter what you think about me. Sometimes what people think about you keeps you from receiving what God wants you to have. Every once in a while, it'd be okay to get beyond what people think about you. And let's say, I need God. What I need right now, I need God. I need some help. I need some healing. I need some help. I need some deliverance. And I need it now. And, and if, you can't, if you can't honor me in that and you can't receive me in that, I'm sorry. But right now, I'll talk to you later. I'll apologize later. But right now, i got to get radical for Jesus. Right now, I need some help. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. And the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open. And listen to this. Everyone's bands were loose. Even those people that weren't praising God got set free. Do you know that if we'd really praise God like we should, there'd probably be some people around us that would get set free. 
there'd probably be some people around us that would get delivered. Their bands would come off. So Paul and Silas, they're put in the inner jail. They're in stocks and bonds. I mean, they got their feet in shackles. They got their hands in shackles. And, and so I'm sure they're thinking like this. Well, you know, the devil did a number on us this time. All we were doing is preaching the gospel. He really put us in, he put us in a hard place this time. But Mr. Devil, you made one mistake. You know what it was? You should have put some tape on my mouth. Listen to me, because if I can move my mouth, I can move a mountain. Come on, help me. Two more minutes. Come on, help me. If you can move your mouth, you can move your mountain. It, because your voice is your address in the Spirit. And when they lifted up praise, God's power came set on that praise, set on that glory. That glory came and shook that prison and opened those doors and set the prisoner free. And as long as you got a mouth, you can make it. As long as you got a mouth, you can praise your way out. You can thank your way out. You can bless your way out. As long as you got a mouth, you can praise God out of anything if you got a mouth. See, there's a pathway of celebration. There's a pathway of celebration. You remember the story I've told you a couple of times? Joyce likes this story. It was, it was this, this church down in Texas, and they had this uh, one fella, and it was a Pentecostal church, and they'd grown and grown, and they finally moved across the tracks. And this was they called him Shouting Gary. Boy, he shouted at the drop of a hat. He carried his own hat. He was always shouting, and nobody could stop his praise. And the pastor said, now Sunday we're going to dedicate the building, Shouting Gary. And I want you to just, will you please just tone it down? Will you just dial it back a little bit? Tone it down just a little bit. And if you do, I'll buy you a brand new pair of cowboy boots. So the pastor said, because we're going to have the mayor and the police chief and everybody's coming. It's going to be a day of dignity and honor. Could you just, just, just dial it back just a little bit? Just, if you could just dial it back. And he said, new pair of boots. Pastor said, brand new pair of cowboy boots. In Texas, cowboy boots are a big commodity. He said, I, I, I'll do it for cowboy boots, Pastor. I'll give it my best for a pair of cowboy boots. <laughs> and so they came in Sunday. Place was packed. Dignitaries on the platform. And the choir began to sing. And the first song, well, it was kind of flat. Wasn't that great. But the second song was his favorite song. They made a mistake. It was his, it was his favorite song. They made a mistake. It was his favorite song. And he sat there and he started, he started tapping his foot. And the next thing you know, he's clapping his hands. And then he stood up and it was on then. And he finally, he said, he yelled. The choir singing loud and the Spirit of God started moving. He said, Pastor, I'm sorry. Boots or no boots, I got to praise the Lord. Boots or no boots, I can't, I can't quench my praise for a pair of cowboy boots. Boots or no boots, I got to praise the Lord. Come on, stand with me tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, let's take about a minute and praise the Lord. Come on, give Jesus a radical praise. Come on, shout aloud. Hallelujah. I'm a victor, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. God, I praise you on the worthy. God, you're holy. You're good. God, I give you thanks tonight. Open doors of victorious church. It's alive. You're breathing in us. You're healing us. God, you're a good God. You're a good God. Hallelujah. Boots or no boots, I'm going to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, praise God. Hallelujah. And some of you, you've been begging God and begging God and begging God. Time to stop begging. You're not a beggar. It's time to start thanking God it's done. Start thanking God you are healed. Start thanking God your finances have changed. Start thanking God your family's saved. Start thanking God. Come on, take about 30 seconds and thank God it's done. How would you act if you had it right now? How would you act? Hallelujah. How would you act? How would you act? Come on, how would you act? How would you act? Come on, boots or no boots, I got to praise the Lord, Pastor. I'm sorry, Pastor, I tried. I gave it my best shot. I can't stop my praise. Hallelujah. Oh, he shed his blood. He died on the cross. He rose again. I'm thankful tonight. 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 I'm thankful. I'm glad I'm pastor and open door. I'm thankful I'm in this house tonight. I wouldn't want to be in another church in the world because this is where God put me. My seat is here. God, I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. There's a pathway of celebration. Well, you just keep thanking God. And you go before your enemies with a song. And you say, I'm going to praise the Lord. 
You can mess. You can do what you need to do, whatever you have to do, enemies. But I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, while we're praising God, go ahead and pray for the Internet family right now. Now, Internet family, we have a church in here tonight. There's a powerful anointing. I want you to start praising God. Right where you are, start giving God radical praise. Let's stop the murmuring, stop the complaining, and let's bless the Lord. Let's give Him the glory. Let's praise Him. We're not beggars. We are the blessed seed of Abraham in Christ. Redeemed and filled. We're free in Christ. We're healed in Christ. We are what God says we are. We have what God says we have. We can do what God says we can do. We are blessed. That's what God said. And I thank Him for His faithfulness to His Word. So let's rejoice and we give praise to God. I'm praising God. Your need. Start praising God like you got it. Like it's yours. Like it's done. Start thanking God like it's done right now. And we'll see you Sunday if not before. And in everything, give thanks. Celebrate, shout, and be radical in your praise for Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah.